submarine force since this is our centennial and we're celebrating the centennial of the base. And then these guys are going to serve you like they would in the war room of submarine. So uh, I think you'll be pleasantly pleased to, to see how everything goes. But I'm going to turn this over to, to uh, my cadre here and they're going to do the presentations and then enjoy your lunch, enjoy your stay. And hopefully there'll be great things to say about it. We're going to tell you a little bit about the history of the base because uh, this is uh, pretty neat. If uh, uh, you weren't riding in my van, I'm not sure if Mr. Zenon told you, but we're celebrating the 100th birthday of the base. And, uh, and it's a pretty uh, pretty big event. So you can hit me in my first slide there. Um, this is the first submarine base really in the world. Um, and uh, the base itself was bought. Um, from the state of Connecticut, the land was bought or given by the state of Connecticut in the 1860s, um, and it was originally a coaling station for our uh, for our steamships that would come off the coast. and uh, And uh, it was uh, decided after the Civil War that we needed a place for our, in the Northeast for the uh, for our Navy ships to, uh, to to port and to refuel with coal. Um, and so. Uh, um, John Holland, um, kind of the great, great grandfather of the submarine, um, um, and along with uh, Simon Lake, who was also one of the innovative designers of the submarine, uh, were based here in Connecticut and a little bit in Long Island. And um, when the Navy bought the submarine contract from John Holland, and they were built in New Jersey um, originally, those submarines came up to New London in the Groton area in 1915. And so October 1915, the uh, the G1, G2, and G4, along with the E1, D1, and D3, all came up the uh, all came up the Thames River. Uh, some harbored over in New London, some harbored here, along with the Chinooka, which was their tinder ship, the ship that uh, resupplied them and gave them uh, the the maintenance that they needed. And um, so then, on June 21st, 1916, the official orders were written to name this submarine base New London and to also stand up our submarine school. Um, and to this day, pretty much every submarine sailor who is in the United States Navy and then a lot of other navies do come through submarine school here. So everyone, um, and then we can go to the library archives and pull all of their, uh, their basically their subsequent report cards, but everyone from Chester Nimitz to um, um, uh, Dealey, who Dealey Plaza, where John F. Kennedy was assassinated at, he went to sub-school here, he was a uh, recipient of the Congressional Medal of Honor, he was from Dallas, Texas, which is why that area of Dallas, Texas is named after him. We have the Dealey uh, movie theater here, the, 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 the base um, theater is Dealey Center. Um, everyone up to uh, President Jimmy Carter came, uh, came through submarine school here. Um, Senator John McCain, his father was a submariner based out of here, and he grew up as a child here. So, uh, so there's a lot of history that has come through this base and moved throughout the world and, um, and continues to be the first and finest submarine base. Uh, I know from my travels around the world that um, anyone wanting to know what's going on in the United States Navy Submarine Force looks to the New London Day newspaper. You know, so you've got people on the other side of the world reading the New London Day wondering what's going on with the U.S. Navy Submarine Force. So, uh, so we live in a very special part of Southeast Connecticut. So I'm going to tell you a little bit more about submarines and what they do. Um, here's the base. This is about uh, 2008, so about eight years old. A lot of things have uh, changed and been rebuilt since then, but it kind of gives you a, a neat, uh, neat view of, uh, of where the original base used to be is about where the railroad tracks go. So that this area used to be the original part of the base. Since 1916, it has slowly been moved all the way up to about here. And we now are a total of 694 acres uh, make up of submarine base. Uh, majority of it lies in the district of Grot, uh, but there's a tiny tip on the north end that's part of the Next slide, please. Um, so what do we do here at the base? We, we have three missions. We call it uh, fleet, or I'm sorry, fleet, fighter, and family. Our number one job is to get our submarines, and we have 15 that are home ported here, is to get our submarines underway and out to sea to go do their job as submarines. So those submarines that are home ported here, we, uh, we help provide the maintenance, we provide the training, um, and, uh, and, and basically get those submarines ready to go on their missions. Well, the, the way to do that, our submarines are built out of steel and nuts and bolts and, and nuclear reactors and all types of things, but the thing that makes the submarine go are our sailors. 
So those are our fighters. We got to make them ready to go on the plane. So that's why we have a hospital here. It's why we have the uh, the sub school here. It's why we have uh, different things that uh, can improve their life. All the barracks, all the classrooms, um, and even the uh, the fun activities, the morale, wealth, morale, welfare, and recreation. So the gym, and the swimming pool, the paintball course, the ropes course, all that to support our sailors to get them ready to go to sea and do the mission. And we also have learned that sailors do their mission best when they know that the people back home are taken care of. Their wives, their husbands, their uh, their children. So we support their families too with our Fleet Family Support Center, our, our housing outside of the base, and making sure uh, that our families and children are taken care of within the community. And that way our sailors can focus on, uh, on, on getting their job done. So who are we here? Like I said, we got about 15 submarines that call this area um, home. Uh, we have our submarine university uh, with the sub school and the submarine learning center. At any given time, we have between two and three thousand uh, sub school students here. So it's almost like a small college, um, and these are usually very young sailors that are straight out of high school and then straight out of boot camp. So they're anywhere between the 18 and 22 year old range. And so we, uh, we provide barracks for them to live in. Obviously, the school that they attend during the day, we have a, uh, a recreation center for them to go. It's got computers and pool tables and whatnot. And then we even have kind of a sports bar area down uh, down at the lower base. And so we really try to take care of them. And then obviously, they eat here for their, uh, their three meals a day. Uh, if at any given time, uh, everybody who calls Subbase One at home, all the sailors, all the civilians like myself, if we all came to work at the same time on the same day, there would be close to about 12,000 people coming. But, like I said, um, even though we have 15 submarines home port here, if you were to go walk on the waterfront today, you might see four. Um, and rarely at any given time are our parking spots for submarines full. Most of the time our submarines are out uh, preparing to go on deployment, on deployment, or they are coming off of their deployment and uh, maintaining a readiness status before they go into a maintenance period. So well, most of the time our submarines are out, um, probably about 60% of their time that they're here. So it's, uh, it's a lot of people are that are stationed here that aren't actually. But uh, we have, like I said, 12,000 family members around here, 12,000 retirees that call this community home that use, they still use our medical facilities, so use our base exchange or our base commissary, but live out in the community with uh, our family. Next slide, please. Um, as the captain mentioned, um, the state of Connecticut has worked very closely with this base to um, ensure that this base stays a member of the Connecticut community. So they have uh, invested their, they, they've invested close to about fourteen million dollars into this base. Um, the senior team today about eight hundred thousand dollars to build this state of the art. Um, Gallic facility that is the exact mock-up of what a Virginia class submarine has. So that way we can train our culinary specialists to cook for 150 people at a time in the space that is smaller than your home kitchen usually. So, uh, so and without having to take up space on a submarine that's actually out to sea. So, uh, so we have this. Uh, another is our um, our dive trainer, uh, our diver support, our diver support facility. Um, we do a lot of the maintenance on our submarines is sometimes while the submarine is still underwater and we need you know deep sea divers that can uh, do that and so we we built a brand new building for them to store their equipment conduct their training and uh and be able to give um, support to the waterfront um, and provide them what they need to do that our old support center our old diving support center used to be in the oldest building on the base. It was built in like 1917 and they you know they have to hang up their their wetsuits from the day before and put them on they're still cold and wet nobody likes that and then these guys are diving in the cold water all day we had a hot tub like you'd have on your back deck that they would warm up in but we've moved we moved all that away we now have some professional saunas professional equipment drying and, uh, and a nice locker room and training room for them to work on these yeah. days a lot of that uh, they're building a three million dollar uh, power plant uh, to uh, help the base maintain its own power uh, because of our 15 submarines that are here that's 15 nuclear reactors that we have to maintain a continuity of power on so if there were to be an emergency in the town of Groton and we lose power that's provided by the city, we can still power the base with our own power plant. Um, 
And then uh, there's a lot of other things uh, between the uh, other infrastructure projects, like our railroad that runs through the base, that is still a public use railroad that is used for uh, cargo that goes from, I believe, uh, from New London to Hartford and uh, in that area. So uh, we're, we're building security measures on that, that railroad track to make sure nobody tries to jump off the train, sneak on the base that way, or, or bring anything that is supposed to be on this base through that railroad track. So, uh, so, this, so the state of, the, of Connecticut has really invested a lot into, uh, into our base. So like I said, uh, this is the, uh, the submarine century, and um, uh, we are doing a lot of different projects to, to help uh, the community understand that, uh, that we are part of the community and we want to stay a part of the community. Uh, one of the uh, big projects that I know the mayor is working on is uh, raising money for the sale of the USS Crock, which was a Los Angeles class submarine um, that was uh, decommissioned about 10 years ago. Um, as they took the submarine apart and, and used it to scrap for other things and whatnot, they kept the sail, which is the, kind of the iconic tower that sticks out of the water in the plains. Um, and uh, they're looking to build a, a park out in the city of Crock to, uh, to uh, commemorate uh, um, Crotton being along with the submarine force. And so uh, so uh, that, that's one of the big things I know Mayor Gilbert is doing. Next slide, please. So uh, the thing I love about these old pictures is that a lot of things have changed and a lot of things have stayed the same. So uh, this is circa 19 teens, 1920 timeframe. And Crotton still kind of looks about the same. <laughs> you know, there's really not much difference there. Um, but this is one of those uh, those original G or D class submarines that uh, you know they had a very small crew. They don't go very far. Um, they're really more ships that are, have the ability to sink and hide and then come back up, unlike our modern submarines that are built to be underwater and every once in a while they come to the surface. Um, but you know, as you can see, this was the building. This was the original train trestle. This was the original road. Uh, that is now the Gold Star Bridge. And, uh, so uh, it's, uh, it's amazing that, uh, you know, like I said, the more things change, the more things stay the same. We have some more photos that are going to be let to on, uh, show the galleys of what old submarines are. Um, kind of a comparison of what the uh, submarines are used to be like and what they're like now. Our original submarines, uh, maybe about 150, 160 feet long, uh, but they only had a crew of about 25 sailors on board. Um, and they only had a, uh, a range of, you know, maybe 2,000 miles per gas tank. So um, they'd have to refill their gas tank every 2,000 miles. Um, compare that to our latest and greatest submarine, the John Warner, was just commissioned down in Virginia. Uh, almost 400 feet long, a crew of 135 sailors, and they're powered by a nuclear reactor. It only has to be filled up once, and it will last for 30 years. And so, to help kind of put that into proportion, the, the John Warren was commissioned uh, about three months ago. The last commanding officer of the John Warren is in about fifth grade right now. He's in elementary school, the last commanding officer that's going to decommission this ship. And that re nuclear reactor will last that entire time. It will not be a, a refueling period for that reactor. So it's, it's pretty amazing the longevity of these types of ships. So, have you seen a submarine in it? Because this is what they look like. And um, the, 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 the mission of a submarine is strength, agility, endurance. Excellent. And I'll tell you a little bit about why these are important and why this is different than a conventional cruiser, destroyer, battleship, aircraft carrier. Um, the submarine is meant to stay hidden, and its, uh, it's stealth is what really changes our strategy in warfare. And what that can do is one of our submarines can just park off the coast and just sit there for weeks, even months on end, and just watch. And so if I were to park my car on the other side of the street from your house and just sit there and watch, within about a week I would know what time you went to work in the morning, what time you came home, what day your neighbors came over, what clothes you wore, what day you took out your trash, and what, you know, even if I had a set of microphones out there, I might be able to know what you watch on TV, those types of things, and you can develop a pattern of what's going on. Now, 
if I were to park in your driveway and stand out there with one of those types of cameras, you might change your routine a little bit. You might wear nicer clothes, and you might, you know, mow the grass or something like that. So we, we a submarine's able to know what people do on a daily basis, and then after a month of doing that, they can high five the next submarine, and they can come and watch for another month, and uh, and nobody would ever know that they're. And so it's uh, the, the, the stealth part of it is a, uh, is a huge factor in what a submarine does. Like I said, the agility, it's a small ship. It can go most anywhere in the world. And uh, we have we have submarines right now that are up on the North Pole, in the USS Hartford, based out of here. Is, uh, currently, uh, they, I think they just left, actually, but last week we were on the North Pole. And, uh, and, uh, and it's pretty amazing. Um, and I'll show you the map here in a second, but Believe it or not, a submarine can leave Subbase New London and be in the Yellow Sea off the coast of China faster than a submarine leaving from San Diego. Because we can go under the polar cap, pop out on the other side of Alaska, and be in the Pacific Ocean much faster than a submarine leaving from San Diego across the, across the Pacific Ocean. So, but it is a payload. Um, our, uh, especially our Virginia class submarines are built with lots of different options. So we can carry 24 torpedoes, we can carry 24 Tomahawk missiles, we can carry 4 torpedoes, and 50 Navy SEALs. There's a lot of different things for a lot of different missions that uh, the submarine provides. So uh, again, it just shows our, our, the, the range of missions, everything from good old fashioned sinking ships to uh, the intelligence, running the Navy SEALs, uh, listening and uh, observing mine warfare, working with the carrier strike group for uh, full battle here, and even Tomahawk launch missiles. The Tomahawk missiles have a range of about a thousand miles, so they can park way off the coast and put one, you know, into somebody's bedroom window very quickly. It's, it's pretty amazing. Next slide. So where are our submarines today? Obviously, our submarines uh, base where we are at, but uh, fourth in New Hampshire. Uh, one of our great shipyards there in Portsmouth that uh, they could remain. Kings Bay, Georgia, Norfolk, home of the Atlantic Fleet. But we also have them in Japan. Um, we have a uh, sub base in Guam, uh, Italy, Diego Garcia, which is a little rock in the middle of nowhere. And along our, uh, along our west coast, too. Like you said, you can pull out a crop and, and go underneath the polar cap and be into the Pacific Ocean a lot faster than the ship. So it's, uh, it's pretty amazing. So, a little bit about what we're doing here today and eating in, uh, eating in the galley. This picture's taken in uh, 1919, I believe it's actually Christmas Day, 1919, December 20th, 1919. This is an S-Class uh, submarine. Um, and this is their galley. And it's actually pretty neat. You can see they've got these old folding chairs and, uh, and then their tables. I think these are tables and even there's like a, it looks like a bed folded up against the bulkhead here. So it, it actually kind of works as two different rooms. It's a, it's a meeting room, it can be a meeting room, and it can be a, uh, it can be a hospital. And today, we still use that. Um, the wardroom in the, uh, in, the, in the Virginia and Los Angeles class submarine, um, where the officers eat, also works as the ship's hospital. And, uh, and so, uh, so yeah, so our corpsman goes in there, and he does everything from regular checkups to if, you know, worst case scenario, they have to do an appendectomy on board, and that has been done. And, uh, and they'll just, you know, stretch it out on the, on the dinner table, cut them open, sew them up, and he's good to go. But the thing that's amazing is that a Virginia class has 135 sailors, and they serve four meals a day because they're running around the clock. So think about it, they're serving four, 550 meals every day out of a kitchen that size. And that's what these guys do best. Next slide. So uh, loading out a submarine, you know, they go out for planning on going out for 90 to 120 days, you know, without stopping, without serving. So they, they're packing every nook and cranny full of peanut butter, full of cans. Um, they actually line the deck of the submarine with these big cans and then put plywood on top of it just to have more room to put cans. So they actually walk, they eat themselves down to the floor. <laughs> so, uh, so, but yeah, nothing like, the more things change, the more things stay the same. Yeah, so everybody's loading stuff up back in the World War II era, and they're doing the same thing here today. Next slide, please. Um, our culinary specialists, like Petty Officer Blair and Master Chief Dalon, um, Submarine sailors volunteer twice. They volunteer one to sign up for the Navy to begin with. 
and two, they volunteer to work in the submarine force. And so, uh, a person like Petty Officer Blair will have gone through regular Navy boot camp, and then he goes on to culinary school, and then he will go to submarine school and report to his first boat. Um, on our uh, current boats, we have about six culinary specialists, um, a chief petty officer is a senior enlisted guy, and uh, one of our supply officers who oversees all of that. Uh, but as our uh, as our sailors kind of grow up in the uh, in the culinary specialist community, they go on to different um, um, professional schools. And so uh, we have sailors that work with uh, our friends up at Foxwoods and Mohegan Sun Resort, and uh, we have celebrity chefs that come down. I believe just recently. Uh, um, yeah, Rob, Chef Robert Irvine was uh, was here and uh, and worked with some of our sailors and uh, and uh, we have sailors that go to New York City and work at the work at Ritz Carlton for a couple of weeks. And so uh, so they really uh, do a great job in learning not just how to cook for the masses but to to cook well for them. Um, and that is so well recognized that the White House usually nabs submarine sailors to work in the uh, in the White House mess. And so uh, so we're really proud when our sailors are able to do something. But again, more things change, more things stay the same. So, next slide, please. Uh, one thing, uh, you know, when a sailor goes out on a submarine, they really are, we've taken away a lot of their creature comforts of life. So the one thing that we can't provide them is really good food. And, uh, and to break up the monotony in a lot of that, they have special nights. And so I've always been told that Saturday nights is pizza night. You know what day of the week it is when you're having pizza because that's a Saturday night. And then um, they also have their holiday meals. They do a big, they do a big spread for uh, Thanksgiving, Christmas, Easter, Fourth of July, those types of things. Um, and then a big night is halfway night. And they're halfway through the deployment and, um, and uh, they mark their halfway day the cruise to pick whatever meal they want for that. And then they like to challenge their uh, they like to challenge their culinary specialists. So they have Iron Chef competition where they you know packets of ketchup, a jar of mayonnaise, and some lettuce. See what you can do with it. And then you know they have a meal with it. So uh, so it's pretty amazing. But these are some uh, pictures from about the mid '90s. Uh, them have a pizza night in the USS Philadelphia. And here's a birthday party on board uh, the USS Harvey, which was uh, soon lost uh, after these pictures were taken. So, next slide, please. And that's it. So uh, I'm here to answer any questions, and the ones I can't, I got some other folks who, uh, to help me answer. So, any questions? Okay. Yes, ma'am. You had mentioned early on that um, other navies also come here to trade. That's correct. Uh, For example, um, you guys can help me out on this. I know I've we've seen uh, Canadian. You get some Canadian, uh, the Royal Navy, and then the Australians will sometimes cycle through. Most of the time it's NATO partners, um, but those you'll see uh, a lot of times there are officers, chiefs will come through and get used to the, um, just the environment. Great. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, yeah. Sure. Uh, we uh, boat along the Thames River a right. lot in every time we go under the bridge. My kids who are now teens always have a question about what if the bridge was going to have destruction during the war time, right. how would the submarines get out? That is a good question. We do get that question a lot. Yes. And, and as you can tell from the photo, now the base was established, the, the bridge, we're well aware, we're north of the bridge. Yeah. So there are contingency plans in place, and so if something were to happen, uh, it would not really impact us, it would just be a matter of time. Now remember, we've got 15 submarines that are home ported here, at any given time, two-thirds of them are at sea. One-third one on deployment, one-third maybe conducting local operations and training, and then one-third at home port. So, uh, we're well aware of our location. Right, so most of, our, most of the submarines are already out to sea. And we actually, like I showed the map, we have a lot of other places that our submarines could go if they were out to sea and could not make it in here. So that, that is, that's a very good question, but has been thought of. And, believe it or not, we do raise the railroad trussle up for submarines, but our submarines are able to get underneath the railroad trussle if it were stuck down. Yes, ma'am. So is there a... Uh... So when they go out and they're going out into Long Island Sound, yes. is, is there a, a certain um, place where then they have to go under, or that's routine for them to they, go they under? They have an area called the dive point. I'm sure these guys can tell me a little bit better about that. So pre-plan before you even depart, there's a uh, top secret dive point. Uh, out past a certain depth where once you reach that, you're cleared to submerge. It's the captain's prerogative where and how he wants to do that, and he'll brief his, his operations officer and then the crew 
but that basically what they do is they give you water space out in the wide blue ocean, and once you reach your basically your safety parameters, that's when you can dive. So they're always coming through. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. No. There, there are safety. Yes, ma'am. There, there are safety parameters that the submarine has to meet before it can dive. So. What we do is we once those parameters are met and we're within our operating space, what it's called, that's when we do. And what's you, you, every submarine dive area is different. So for us here in uh, in coming out of New London, it's several hours before they can get to that dive point. In Hawaii, it's about 20 minutes. You know, what I mean, they really can't just pull from the pier and go under. It. But because of the yeah, but because of the Atlantic Shelf and some other uh, areas around here with the islands and whatnot, they wait till they're well up to the Atlantic. Before they Yes, What's the typical speed um, that the submarines do in, when, when they're traveling? They're, the, the unclassified speed is 25 knots, or 20 knots, I'm sorry, above 20 knots, and uh, and, uh, and uh, depth greater than 800. Sir? What do you do with the waste, like the cans and the leftover dishes? Sorry, we brought some this place for you. This is what we call a uh, trash disposal unit can. It's a, it's a cylinder can. We basically compact our, our trash into this, all our dry trash. All this stuff. We have certain parameters of stuff we can't discharge it. If it meets the parameters, we'll compact it here, we'll weigh it down to the negative points, and then it'll, it'll be uh, discharged at the bottom of the ship. Yeah, that's, that's, that's why we brought it up so you can get an idea of all the, the compact. So we do. Anything else you want to show there? Uh, we just brought some uh, some static displays and some other stuff. This is a sugar can. All our flat, a lot of our products are from scratch. So flour, sugar, shortening we have to get. So this is an example of a sugar can, a 20 pound sugar can ball our insurance. Again, like, like Mark was talking about, we generally walk on our food or it's stored in the interim because endurance is the name of the game. We want to try to be able to sustain four meals a day, 135 people for about 120 days. So we've got to put food everywhere. And this is one of the examples that's got to be durable enough to just be to live in the internet. One of the other examples is tuna. Many people see the tuna package. So this development started with the submarine force because we needed something other than a number 10 can for storage. So we went back to industry and designed us something that that's durable but it holds the, the quantities that we need. So they made this packaging for us. And now, as you see, it's, it's moved out in the industry. You see it on the downtown. The, the There's one design that the government started with. What's, oh, sorry. Um, fresh food. Yes. OK, so you're out there for 120 days. What sort of fresh food do you bring with you? And how do you plan on using that? Well, what we try to do is a lot of our products are dry. Yeah. And we'll try to go seven to 10 days with fresh. We'll leave the port with whatever fresh we can hold, yeah. and once that runs out, we go into what we call an extended menu. Where we'll do pasta salads, bean salads, we get creative with it, just like potato salad, wherever we can make it. Yeah. We exercise it out. Or we'll put canned fruits, sometimes we have dehydrated products that we'll rehydrate. Last year, for Lieutenant, can you talk about what you do because you have freezers and chill boxes, and when you get ready for deployment, you, you just switch it. So, uh, like you're saying, we have both a freezer and a chill box, essentially a, a large refrigerator or reefer. Um, when we're in port or we're staying close to home, we keep it as a refrigerator so we can maintain a longer duration for fresh fruits, vegetables. But going on deployment, uh, good chance that you are not going to surface for 90 days. So you don't have that opportunity. You're going to bring what you can store in an open space, but then you're going to convert that reefer into a freezer. And then you're going to start separating into what you can reach and use more frequently versus stuff that you're going to start touching later on. And that's going to be up to your, your leading uh, CS because he's basically going to lay out how he wants that 90 days to go. He's going to put all your beef in one spot, all your pork in one spot, all your fish in one spot. And he's going to know exactly where that is. And literally, once you get up to Master Chief's level, he can look in there in about two seconds and be like, oh, so we're at 30 days. It's, it is that they get that proficient at it. When you do breakfast, are you preparing all your meals? Or do you divide it up into two separate breakfasts? Um, I make meals at Camp Diana National Guard, right. and I know I'm in the kitchen for 4.30, serving for 7, right. and then clean up, 
Um, I mean, how do you do it? <laughs> yeah, uh, we're separated into two watches. Uh, a, a morning and an evening watch. The, the cook uh, for the morning watch, well, he will do lunch and dinner. Essentially, he'll prepare those two meals, and then somebody will come relieve him, and he'll do uh, mid and breakfast. Also, along with doing the big shot items for the next day. And we just, uh, we'll go through a watch and we'll just feed probably 75, 75 people up that right way. And, and when they're just our stands, that's it. We'll just kind of do it. It's storage. Um, I mean, if you're serving pudding or something, I mean, do you put it in bowls and put it away, or just serve it as you go along? Or uh, our puddings and our stuff like that, we'll put on our salad bar okay. and in, uh, in a pan, and they can just self-serve okay. themselves. Okay. I got one. Yes, sir. You got a hood running outside production kitchens at restaurants. It's 100% makeup there. How do you deal with that? And heat? Where's it go? It gets free. It basically, so the way that the submarine works is it has an internal atmosphere monitoring system, uh, which ends up tying into the entire ventilation of the ship. So the way that the hood works is it's going to work the same way that it would in an industrial kitchen. In terms of heat, we have vents, uh, I'm not sure if they're in there or not, but they have roll or rotator vents right over the, the ranges and all the hot areas to keep the cooks cool. And then to get rid of the smoke or otherwise that's generated, it's gonna be pulled in through the hood and it's gonna be pulled into the machinery room, which is what's gonna recycle our air and it's gonna get processed out. So that's how it works. You might, every now and then, especially if you're doing something like teriyaki that might generate some smoke, you'll get a little bit of a haze in the air for 25 minutes. So you have two heating sources for your kitchen, with steam and electric? Yes. yes. Does kill your habit for every meal for three months? Yes, ma'am. We have, on the yeah. summary force, we have a 28 day cycle menu. We have breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and it just rotates. So it's no flexibility. Days. Somebody keeps saying, I have steak again and I there's some flexibility, depending like we talked about halfway nights and different variables, the crew can decide we're not going to do be loaf, we're going to do this. But again, you're kind of contained with what endurance you have on board, so if you use your ground beef here, then you're going to have to not use ground beef somewhere else. And, and that goes to really the, it goes to the outlook that your, your supply officer and then your leading CPO had before they got on deployment because they need to look at how they're going to basically spread it apart. Like on occasion, you might have somebody who makes a mistake and they order the wrong unit of issue for chicken. So then you get that exact problem that somebody's sitting there like, if I have chicken again, I'm going to lose my mind. But most of the time that's not the case. Um, you do a very good job of breaking it up evenly. And then also one of the benefits in subforce as opposed to the surface, because with the surface, there's a lot more room for you to kind of spread your things out. And they tend to do a lot of pre-made things. Um, the CSs have to build everything from scratch. The benefit to that is because it says Salisbury steak doesn't necessarily mean that that's the only thing you can make with those ingredients. So you can mix it up a little bit for your crew, which tends to give the CSs a little bit of uh, credit along the street because you know they know the guy. Hey, the guys want this instead of that. So why don't we the same ingredients? Why don't we make this for them so we can change the monotony?